Hi, and welcome to the Grind Academy podcast. My name is Rob Patterson, and I'm a former CEO who traded the comfort of that life to create this podcast. The Grind Academy podcast has one main purpose, to be a platform for sharing experiences and practical life skills not taught at school. Growing up, my parents chose to serve their life as youth missionaries. This meant relocating several times and having to constantly find my place in new towns. I often faced volatile situations at home from troubled youths and I struggled to fit in at new schools. My academic grades suffered and despite securing a place at hotel school, I struggled to focus and eventually dropped out. Still, I managed to make it to a high-profile CEO role for one of Britain's largest hotel chains, and today I own several successful businesses. It was practical life skills, big dreams, and hard grind that guided me on my journey, not grades. That's why each week I'm introducing some of the most inspiring and talented minds from sport, business, literature, and science. I want to share their stories as practical life lessons you can learn from and apply to your personal situation. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Now let's meet today's special guest. Episode 7 is a special one for me because it signifies the direction of the Grind Academy. This podcast has been created to be a practical resource for improving your life. Today I'm joined all the way from Hawaii by Susie Senk. Susie is an international health educator, sleep specialist, speaker, author, and mother. She offers integrative sleep solutions to modern day sleep challenges and helps people of all ages get a better night's sleep quickly and easily. Susie has been doing this for 20 years. Before this podcast, I thought I knew what it counted towards a good night's sleep. However, Susie offers some powerful and insightful tips to give you the best foundation for a successful day. Guys, her energy and passion for sleep wellness are second to none. And if you want to have a better night's sleep, then you don't want to miss this. So without further ado, let's meet Susie Sink. Susie, thanks for joining me on the Grind Academy. Uh, Appreciate you being here with me, all the way from Hawaii. Yeah, hello. (laughs) Aloha, aloha. (laughs) <laughs> appreciate the um appreciate you taking the time to join us on the podcast this is a a really cool uh, topic that i've been dying to do a podcast on actually uh one for out of my own personal interest but two is the direction i want to take the podcast in uh being more educational on the life skills side so let's dive right in i want to ask you uh straight away is is there a difference between a good and a bad sleep Is there, absolutely, there is a difference between a good and a bad sleep. And I'm sure everyone who's listening knows this because sometimes you wait, nobody, first of all, nobody has a wonderful night of sleep every single night of their lives. It simply is impossible. It doesn't happen that way because life is unpredictable and we have all sorts of things that can be disruptive to sleep. But everybody knows that if they wake up in the morning and they basically slept like a baby, which is actually a misnomer because babies don't sleep well. You want to say that you slept like an eight or a nine-year-old because they sleep like a rock and they sleep through the night. Um, But if you you slept like an eight or a nine-year-old and you wake up and you feel refreshed and ready to go, you you know what that's like. And then I'm sure everyone has also had at least one night where they didn't sleep well. They woke up multiple times, they had a hard time falling back asleep. And when they woke up in the morning, they were not well rested and, and struggled to get through their day. And all of the wonderful feelings that accompany that, including brain fog and fatigue and uh, crabbiness. <laughs> <laughs> so I slept like an eight or nine year old. Why would an eight or nine year old sleep the best? Yeah. So babies don't really generally sleep well because when they're in the womb, they don't have a a set circadian rhythm because they're um, the circadian rhythm is something that, that evolves in response to the cycles of light and dark and also various other um, mechanisms in the body. Uh, So when a baby is born, it really doesn't have a set, a set sleep schedule. And any mother will, will know this because they can be sleeping in the middle of the night and be woken up by their baby kicking them in their sleep because they're active in the middle of the night and having a, a party while mom's trying to get good sleep. 
And so it takes um, several months, uh, oftentimes around the six month mark, uh, a baby will start to get uh, a more regulated sleep cycle. And that's really if the parents have been doing uh, a good job of supporting that process, because it's not something that will kick in naturally on its own if the parents are having an erratic schedule for the baby. Um, but by definitely by the time a child is seven, eight, or nine years old, they should be falling asleep um, approximately around eight, eight thirty at night, and waking up around six, seven o'clock in the morning, and sleeping through the night. And you know, when you um, when a when a child is sleeping, because they have um, more uh, non REM sleep than than adults do, um, they, you can, you can pick them up out of the car and put them in the bed. I even was at dinner the other night and I was talking to a mom and she said, this isn't abuse, I swear, but my child sleeps so deeply that sometimes I'll like play with her arms like a puppet while she's sleeping and, <laughs> and, you know, say like, hi, mom, or just silly stuff because her, her daughter is sleeping so deeply that, um, she isn't even affected by it. So we'd all hope to be able to sleep like like that little girl. <laughs> with our parents playing with our arms. And you said yeah, REM, REM right. sleep there. What, 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 explain to us what REM sleep is. Right. So um, a, an average sleep cycle, and it really does differ um, slightly uh, between, from person to person. So <clears throat> the average sleep cycle is 90 minutes long. And we... Um, it evolves through the night. So it doesn't stay the same throughout the night. Um, in the earlier parts of the night, before midnight, we have more non-REM sleep. And non-REM sleep is um, sleep that is generally believed to um, be primarily for healing the physical body. And it is a time of sleep that we're very still. And um, and, and it's also called deep sleep. And then REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, is a time of sleep where we do a lot of dreaming. We do some dreaming in other stages of sleep, but we do the most of our dreaming in, <clears throat> in REM sleep. And um, the reason that, uh, that it's called REM sleep is because our eyes twitch but we actually have something called, um, paral we have a paralysis that happens because if we didn't have that, we would move and we would be acting out our dreams while we're sleeping. And the um, REM sleep is believed to be pr predominantly the time of sleep that we do um, a lot of uh, emotional processing and, and emotional healing. And so um, most of our, our REM sleep happens in the early parts of the morning. So this is good to know because a lot of people wake up to an alarm clock, which I understand is necessary at times, but it would actually be optimal for people to be able to wake up naturally at the end of their sleep cycle. Because when you wake up with an alarm clock, you're actually cutting into that um, REM sleep and you're not uh, giving your body all of the the time that it's asking for to be able to process the um, emotional challenges from your day. <clears throat> wow, I, I didn't understand that there was an emotional healing that happened while we sleep. So is it possible then to manufacture a, a really good deep sleep? Absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you haven't heard the word sleep hygiene, mm -hmm. It is the term that is used to basically describe all the things that we can control, um, all the actions and behaviors um, and habits that we, that we can do to actively promote good sleep. And, and that's good deep sleep and, and good REM sleep. And um, there's lots of things that, inc that are included in the umbrella of sleep hygiene. Um, I think, uh, based on my experience, my research, um, my experience with, with clients, what I, and my personal experience, what I found to be the most important parts of sleep hygiene are number one routine. So, uh, the body really does well 
when we go to bed and we wake at approximately the same time every day. And it can be really challenging for the body, especially for people who um, do shift work or even people who have like a relatively normal routine during the week, but then they go out on the weekends and they think, oh, well, I'll just sleep in and catch up on my sleep. That you, you might be sleeping the same amount of hours on the weekend as you do during the week, but that doesn't mean that you're getting the same quality of sleep that you would be. And um, there's, there's other things that can also impact the quality of sleep. Like if you're going out and you're eating a heavy meal before bed or you're drinking alcohol, though, both of those things can also be really disruptive to sleep. Um, and the second thing besides routine that I think is at the top of the list in terms of someone being able to really have excellent sleep is also making sure that they're sleeping in a dark environment and throughout the entire day having what I call a healthy light diet. And so people um, oftentimes think that sleep is really just what happens when you get into bed and your head hits the pillow, but really every single thing that you do throughout the entire day affects sleep. And so uh, whether you're getting early morning sunlight exposure also is impactful to your ability to sleep well, whether you're in front of a computer or inside all, all day and not getting natural sunlight throughout the day, but getting a lot of blue light um, can also be impactful. And then whether you're being exposed to bright lights at night, because one of the things that, um, the body needs in order to be able to sleep well is melatonin. And melatonin is uh, produced um, by the pineal gland, but it's produced only in the, um, the presence of darkness. So if you are constantly being uh, exposed to bright lights at night, your body's not going to produce adequate amounts of melatonin in order for you to be able to sleep well. And melatonin is the the neurotransmitter that tells your body when it's time to sleep. So this is, we're kind of crossing subjects here, but or, or jumping subjects, but I feel like this is important since it's coming up in what I'm saying. A lot of people try to take melatonin to help them sleep. And melatonin is really, really good if you have a, um, a dysregulated uh, sleep schedule. So for someone who is, for example, traveling and they're crossing time zones. Uh, melatonin can be really good for jet lag because it will tell your, you know, if it's only, um, if it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night where you arrived, but it's only five o'clock where you came from and your body still thinks it's five o'clock. If you take the melatonin, <clears throat> you're, you're telling your body, you need to sleep now. Now is time to start sleep. But for people who have difficulty, um, so melatonin can be good for helping with falling asleep, but for the purposes of staying asleep, melatonin is really not the best thing to use for that. So what would be the best thing for, for staying asleep? Well, I mean, again, uh, so to get back to what we were saying earlier, besides having a healthy light diet and the routine, another really, really important part of sleep hygiene is temperature. So you want to make sure that the temperature that you're um, of the room that you're sleeping in is is cool. And if you think about it, um, the the reason that this is is because we evolved over a very very long period of time before the advent of electricity, mm -hmm. and the cues that told our body that it was time to go to sleep was the sun setting and the earth cooling. And so that is the very natural primal way that our body knows that it's time to sleep. But a lot of people have, um, have a, you know, have lights that are on all night long. They have ambient light in their bedroom from their alarm clocks or their electronic devices. And also they have a um, regulated temperature in environment in their house, which means that it's, you know, 72 degrees all day, every day. And that doesn't give the body the, the cue that it's cool and now it's time to go to sleep. So in answer to your question, the very best thing that a person can do is make sure that their, their sleep hygiene is optimized. And then if they're having difficulty um, with waking in the middle of the night, there could be other underlying root cause issues that are contributing to that, that 
that then need to be addressed if they're doing all of the all of the right things. And a lot of clients that come to me, that's what they say. They they say, I feel like I'm doing all the right things, but I'm still not sleeping. And so then my work with them is to kind of be a, de- a detective and figure out, first of all, are you actually doing all the right things? Because sometimes people think that they're doing all the right things, but they're actually missing something. And then if they are doing all the right things in terms of their sleep hygiene, what are the underlying health issues that are contributing to why they're not being able to fall asleep and stay asleep? So Alexander Graham Bell has a lot to answer for when it comes to our, our sleep hygiene, huh? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And um, what's his name? Not uh, the, the, the inventor of the light bulb. What was his name? I thought that was Alexander Graham Bell. (laughs) No, that's the telephone. Oh, um, no, it is. Yeah, uh, I can't think of his name right now. But ah, he, yeah, <laughs> he's he's really interesting because he actually is someone who did not believe in in high quality sleep. I've done an Instagram post on on him. I can't oh, really? think of his name right now, but um, it'll come to me in a moment. It's not Einstein. It's uh oh, well, anyways. Um, well, there's uh, there's others like that, isn't there? Because I guess um, more recently, Donald Trump is pretty known for for having a, um, I guess, a different attitude towards sleep, right? And he only sleeps, he claims he only sleeps three or four hours a night. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Donald Trump in a lot of ways is a brilliant man, but he doesn't seem to be the poster child of health if you just look at his, yeah. <laughs> his, his you know, physical body. So I don't know that I would, um, I would follow his health advice. But that, that is an, it's an interesting point because that is a, um, a common perception amongst the entrepreneur world is that you've got to, you've got to work all these hours every day, every night and sleep when you die kind of attitude. And that's quite a dangerous attitude, isn't it? Yeah. If you, if you take the attitude of I'll sleep when I'm dead, then you're probably going to die earlier (laughs) than you would if you took care of yourself Sleep is the number one most important thing for health, hands down. And sleep affects everything and everything affects sleep. So if you're not getting high quality, uh, uh, quality of sleep and also quantity, the, the right quantity of sleep every single night, your body is going to take hits for it. And I'm in my 40s now, and I can tell you that when I was a teenager or in my early twenties, I could pull an all nighter and I could, I could be fine. Now, if I don't get solid eight hours of sleep a night, I feel it. And I can tell because my, um, my ability to, um, speak clearly and think clearly and have a balanced attitude and have the energy that I need to get through my day is all really affected by that. And, um, I think that it's important for people to to realize that even if you think that you are doing okay and that you're um, able to kind of power through your day, it will catch up with you even if you don't feel it right away. And a lot of people are dependent on caffeine in, or other forms of unnatural energy sources like guarana and things like that in order to get through their through their day. The reality is that you, if you if you have good health. You should be able to wake up in the morning, have an abundant amount of energy to get you out of bed, have plenty of energy to power you throughout your entire day without the need for any form of stimulant, and then go to bed and sleep well and do it, do it again and again and again. And so if you're someone who needs, you know, a jolt of caffeine in the morning to get you going, then there's probably some underlying stuff going on that needs to be addressed. Um, so that you can have that natural energy. And the other thing that I would say is that uh, when you when you hear people that say, oh, I only need five to six hours of sleep per day and I'm fine, the reality is they've done studies that show that the the, the app, like the vast majority of people, and I'm talking like 99.99999% of people need somewhere between seven and a half and nine hours of sleep. And the reason that there's that, that, um, that range is because of the fact that not everyone has a 90, a 90 minute exact 
um, sleep cycle per night. So some people might have a 78 minute sleep cycle per night. And then some people might have a 95 minute sleep cycle per night. So when you multiply that by the number of sleep cycles that you're supposed to have per night, that's where you get that range from. But the, um, the people who actually need less than eight hours of sleep per night, who can get by on four to five or six hours of sleep, it's due to a genetic anomaly. And it's like 0.0001% of people on the planet who have that genetic anomaly. Yeah. He, he, Richard Branson is another one that comes to mind. Apparently only needs three hours sleep, but I I'm with you. I, if I don't have eight hours, I'm feeling cloudy and my judgment's not the same and my speech is not the same. And so I want to ask you about um, the impact of let's say bad sleep or, or for the 99.9% .9 of us who need eight hours what are what are the physical impacts in terms of like weight loss or um, memory or those sort of things are there are there does it manifest itself in our physical being can you ask that question again just because the way you said it was a little confusing for me um if we have bad sleep um regularly the 99.9 .9 of us who need eight hours a night and we're not getting nine nine hours how does it manifest itself physically on our bodies in terms of weight or memory or speech, or as you say, cloudy, cloudy, um, memories. Yeah, it's, it's all of the above and mm -hmm. it's individual and unique for the person based on their physiology and their genetics. So, um, there is literally not one single known physiological process that is not affected for better or for worse by sleep or a lack of it. And so, um, you mentioned weight. So for weight, definitely a lack of sleep will affect uh, a person's ability to, um, to lose weight or to maintain a healthy weight. And it's really, it's, it's quite simple, the, the, the reason that it works. So our bodies have basically two nervous system states. We have um, parasympathetic and we have sympathetic. Parasympathetic is um, where we're supposed to be most of the day, um, which is rest, digest, relax, heal, and procreate. And the sympathetic state is um, fight, flight, hide, freeze. So it's what you do when there's a, a danger. And our, our bodies are designed to be in that parasympathetic state most of the time. And then only when there's a, um, an, a you know, a reason for alarm to shift into a sympathetic dominant state. But so many of us spend so much time in a sympathetic dominant state because of the um, massive amounts of stress that we have in our lives. And when the body is in a sympathetic dominant state, it the every single um, biological process that occurs inside the body shifts to a a way of being able to protect the body. So in terms of weight, one of the things that happens is that it will boost the amount of cortisol in the system. It will boost the amount of blood sugar in the system because that's what a human body needs in order to run from a saber tooth tiger. And so when, but, but when we stay in a, um, a sympathetic dominant state, when we, when we stay in that, we have chronic inflammation in the body. And when we have chronic inflammation in the body, the body can't do those other processes, which require the parasympathetic state to be able to rest, digest, heal, relax, and procreate. So when we have an inflamed state, we're naturally not going to be able to, um, to lose weight the way that, that we want to. Our, um, our brains are not going to be able to recall information the way that we would like because we're... Um, we're not trying to, you know, do math equations, we're trying to fend for our lives. So if you just think about it in terms of those very simple terms of what would the body need in order to fight off a, a, a virus or fight off an animal or, you know, defend oneself versus relax and heal and, and rejuvenate or, or make new life. There are very, very different processes. And, um, and, and both very important for for our well being. The problem is that m most people just are not 
living a, um, a way that uh, supports a more restful, relaxing state. And so their bodies are in a constant, constant state of stress, which is not good. Yeah, so quite, quite the opposite is true, that actually getting a good night's sleep will be more productive than, than the uh, sleep when you die attitude. Um, I want to ask about hygiene again, because you, you mentioned sleep hygiene, which I think is a great term. Um, is there anything else in the, in the physical, uh, I guess, bedroom, <laughs> sanctuary, sleep sanctuary, that you can do or tips or tricks? We've got dark, uh, we've got temperature that you mentioned, uh, routine is quite important. Is there anything in the physical state that you can do to improve sleep quality? There's a lot. <laughs> so some people are really sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies mm -hmm. and some people are, are not um, as sensitive or as aware of their own sensitivity. So for people who are, you really want to make sure that you don't have electronics in the bedroom. Um, a lot of people have gotten in the custom of sleeping with their phone right next to their bed because they use it as an alarm clock. Mm -hmm. And that's really not conducive to sleep. Also, um, even if you don't have any electronics in your bedroom, there's electromagnetic frequencies that are just coming out of the wall because of the, the wiring that goes through your wall. And so it's, and if you take a meter, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's pretty significant. So um, just being aware of the electromagnetic frequencies in your bedroom and maybe doing a test, uh, shutting off the breaker to your bedroom one night and seeing if you sleep more deeply um, could also help. Uh, another thing is toxins in the bedroom. So a lot of people sleep on mattresses that are loaded with toxins and, um, and, and these are, are really not good for your health. If you um, think about it, you sleep in your bed uh, with your face right next to that mattress for about a third of your life. And normal mattresses that are not organic are treated with all sorts of chemicals um, and flame retardants and their, their carcinogens. So it's really not, uh, not a good idea to sleep on a mattress that is, is loaded with those. And, you know, carpet, there's so many, there's so many aspects of um, a bedroom that unfortunately these days have the potential to have um, toxic chemicals. The, the blackout curtains that a lot of people use have, have chemicals in them. Um, the carpet that is in people's um, bedrooms has chemicals. So one thing that you can do is make sure that you air out your house on a regular basis, even in the winter time, open all of your windows and just let the fresh air in. Another thing is you can get um, air cleaning uh, plants and, and put those in your bedroom. You can also use an air filter. Um, a lot of people are light sleepers and they're sensitive to noise and they might, might not even realize that the reason that they're waking up every night is because their neighbor, you know, leaves to go to work at four in the morning or the, you know, the, the street cleaning truck goes by and, and wakes them up and they don't, and they don't realize it. So um, having some sort of white noise machine can be really helpful for a lot of people. Um, yeah, but I feel like those are kind of more of the, the minor tweaks, but the main things are you have to make sure that you're, um, that your that your light diet every single day is conducive to sleep, and that means getting uh, a lot of natural light exposure throughout the day, protecting yourself with a good um, lens technology if you are in front of the computer, especially after dark, and making sure that you don't have bright lights at night, and definitely um, making your room as dark as possible and keeping that temperature good. It's also um, helpful, I think, to take a hot shower or a hot bath right before bed if you're having difficulty sleeping. The reason for this is because um, this it's, it's all the same thing, but basically the temperature in your body will be uh, temporarily elevated, but then it'll cool off really quickly. So if you can time when you get into bed and when you're, you're starting to fall asleep with when that temperature is dropping from, um, from that hot shower, then it'll help you also be able to fall asleep more easily. Cool. I have a, uh, I recently bought a mother-in-law's tongue. I don't know if you know that plant, 
to sit next to my bed because apparently it produces oxygen all night. But uh, I, oh, like you say, I, I wouldn't say that it's um, it's a it's a minor tweak. I wouldn't say it's an obvious change since I've had it, but all of it together collectively by making sure it's really dark and the temperature is a bit cool. Actually, it makes a really big difference collectively. Yeah, I have a couple other things to, to say. One is that a lot of, you know, if you look in, in the magazines about like the way that a beautiful bed should look, there's like a thousand different pillows on the bed and they're all fluffy. And um, the reality is that when we're upright, when our heads are upright, it signals to the body that we should be awake and alert. Mm -hmm. And when our, when our, um, our heads are, our bodies are flat, it signals to the body that it's, it's time to rest. So if you're sleeping on and, and pillows and mattresses and the comfort of those is very individual, which is why I never recommend one specific thing for people. But if you're sleeping on a whole bunch of pillows that are elevating your head, if you have um, sleep apnea, that might be helpful for you. But otherwise, you really should be sleeping on a flat surface. It's also not healthy for your cervical spine to be having your head forward all the time. And so um, one of my um, friends who's a physical therapist and has had like nine children told me that he would always go into his children's bedroom after they were asleep and yank the pillows out from behind their neck because it, it can cause um, long-term neck problems if you're sleeping with your head forward every night. So the choice of pillows also matters. And then also caffeine is something that, mm you know, the whole conversation of diet is another big topic, but one of the big no-nos is caffeine. And for some people, and this really depends on your genetics, some people are really fast metabolizers of caffeine. And those are the people that can have a shot of espresso right before bed, or, you know, have a big bowl of ice, uh, chocolate ice cream before bed, and then be able to sleep just fine. But lots of other people either have a sensitivity to caffeine or they're not um, good metabolizers of caffeine. And so if you are a, a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, or even just eat chocolate, um, but you have difficulty sleeping, I would say cut out the caffeine for two weeks because it takes a while for it to get out of your system fully, but cut it out for, for a period of two weeks and see if that doesn't, um, dramatically improve your sleep. Another thing with food is, um, there's other forms of stimulants that, um, that really can affect the GABA glutamate balance in the brain. And one of these things is MSG. Um, and MSG um, has several different forms uh, that are kind of hidden in food. So a lot of chips have something called ye uh, perula yeast, or it might even just say yeast. But these things can be very stimulating to the, to the brain because they're a form of glutamate and glutamate is a excitatory um, neurotransmitter in the brain. And GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. And so when you have too much glutamate, either when your body is producing it or you're consuming it, it's difficulty to be able to, for the body to wind down. And that gets back to actually answering the question that you asked me a long time ago, which is if someone isn't sleeping through the night well, what do I recommend that they take? And, and GABA can be something that can be very helpful for people. Also 5-HTP and L-theanine. And are they pre prescribed or is there something natural and organic that they can, they can uh, purchase? Those are to... all things that you can, you can get over the, the counter. Yeah. So if somebody is a coffee lover, me, <laughs> is there a time that we should stop having caffeine in the day? Should it only be in the morning? X amount of hours before we sleep or just not at all? <laughs> well, it's, it's individual for, for each person. And that's why I say do an experiment and see for yourself. Coffee has, um, caffeine has a very long half-life. So it even, um, even if you drink it in the morning, there's still going to be some of it in your system in the afternoon and early evening when you're trying to, to fall asleep. And so, um, depending on how rapidly you metabolize it, um, depends on how long it will stay in your system. And so for me, I I'm hypersensitive to all types of caffeine. If I drink coffee, I will have heart palpitations and a headache the next day. And I, my sleep will be destroyed. Um, some people, um, so 
chocolate has both caffeine and theobromine in it. Um, and so some people are um, rapid metabolizers of theobromine, but not caffeine. So you also have to play around with it because you might have uh, no problem with caffeine, but I mean, with, with uh, coffee, but have a, a problem with chocolate or vice versa. Got it. But I would so say, to, to, like, to give a general answer for your question, I would say definitely do not drink coffee in the afternoon if you're having difficulty sleeping. Like, cut it out before noon, for sure. Cut it out before noon. So I want to ask you about multiple sleeps per day versus one single sleep. The pandemic has led to a lot more people working from home, and that opens the door for an afternoon nap. The Spanish are famous for siesta. So is it better that we get one single sleep or should we have, can we get away with multiple sleeps per day? So again, it's, it's individual and it's dependent upon the person. And, and really you'll know, you know, if you take a nap in the afternoon and you wake up and you feel great and it doesn't make it more difficult for you to fall asleep. But if it, if you, take a nap and then you wake up feeling groggy and then you try to go to bed and you can't fall asleep, then mm -hmm. napping at that time of day for that length of time is not going to work for you. So there's a, um, there's something called sleep pressure with a specific chemical in your, in your brain. And the, the longer that you, so there's two different things that kind of act on your ability to fall asleep. And one of them is the circadian rhythm, like we discussed, and the production of melatonin and the melatonin and cortisol um, relationship. And the other one is this other chemical called adenosine or adenosine. And basically, the longer that you stay awake, the, um, the more sleep pressure that you have, and then the more that your body just naturally needs to fall asleep. Um, but when you take that nap, it, uh, it decreases the sleep pressure that you have. And so then you don't have that dramatic urge to need to be able to fall asleep. And, um, what I will say is that we have, um, so cortisol is the, like the, the stimulating hormone in our, in our body. And it's, uh, supposed to be the highest first thing in the morning when we wake up and then it kind of, um, dips down um, until there's this uh, little dip in the mid afternoon, which is around the same time that cultures traditionally had siesta time. And <laughs> yeah. then it goes up in the afternoon and then it's supposed to be rock bottom in the middle of the night while we're sleeping. A lot of people who don't sleep well have dysregulated cortisol um, levels. And that's something that you can do a lab test, a 24 hour saliva cortisol to see where your, um, your cortisol levels actually are because some people will have really, really low cortisol in the morning and they really drag to get out of bed and they need that coffee, mm -hmm. but then they can have, um, high cortisol in the evening. So they can have their cortisol, um, levels kind of not in the right places. Um, but anyways, so because we have that natural dip in the afternoon, it, it's a biological way for us to, or it's, it's kind of nature's way of saying, Hey, take a break. Yeah. And if you, if you honor your body, then you will notice that you do kind of get a little bit sleepy in the afternoon. And for some people, um, napping doesn't feel good to them, but I think for everyone, just being aware of that and rather than powering through and, you know, eating a, a bar of chocolate to get you through that time or, you know, popping a, a Coke or an energy drink, taking a 20 minute break and just resting can be really, really wonderful. And it will also help you to kind of decompress. I, I call it um, defragging because I feel like if you take that time in the day to um, just slow down, it actually does something really wonderful for your brain in that it it allows your brain to kind of um, process what's happened in the morning, which then allows you to be more productive in the afternoon. But if you just power through your day, you'll probably find that parts of your, um, your memory and your, your processing and your brain have a more difficult time because it, it's, 
it's it, it's a lot for it to get through the entire day um, without a break. Yeah. I, I want to talk about dreaming because before you mentioned um, that dreaming can be a part of the healing process for, for what we're going through emotionally uh, and there's certain times where we, we're dreaming. I wanted to ask you about dream content. And this is more out of curiosity than anything. Is, is there anything in our dream content if we remember our dreams, I struggle to remember them, but if we do remember them, is there anything in our dream content that can tell us about our sweet sleep quality? Well, hold on. I have a question for you. So when you say you struggle to remember your dreams, tell me, uh, what, what do you mean by that? Do you know what? I know, sometimes I wake up and I'll have, I'll have had a vivid dream and I'll know that I've been in a moment, but I can't remember what that moment is. And literally I open my eyes and I know I was in something and I know it was really strong and powerful, but I can't remember for life me what it is. Are so, you waking up in those moments to an alarm clock or are you waking up naturally? Do you know what? I have, if now that you say that, I think it's unnaturally that that happens. It's unnaturally. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would have guessed. Yeah. yeah. If, you, so, if you, if you wake up, naturally you're much more likely to have good dream or recall than if you're jolted awake is that right yeah there you go well i mean fortunately i don't wake up too often unnaturally but that's the occasion that it, i don't really remember them it's um yeah that's that's i'm gonna have to monitor that now so question about the phone because the phone is usually the unnatural thing that wakes us up personally i put my phone on um, it is next to me, <laughs> but it's on. I put it on airplane mode because I don't want to have any distraction through the night. And when I wake up in the morning, I want to go through my routine before I see what's happened, before I take on the day. Does that help in any way? Is that a hack for uh, better sleep hygiene or not? I mean, it's still on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Still, it's <laughs> still emitting EMFs. I mean, it's it's better than you know, having it on and having it dinging and having it, uh -huh. you know, potentially people calling you in the middle of the night, but you're still getting electromagnetic frequencies from it. Yeah. And, less so. Well, the other one that I have on is a, dehumi is a humidifier. So it's kind of there for a purpose to help the quality of the room. I uh, don't wake up as stuffy, but yeah. it's probably not that good, right? I mean, again, it depends on how sensitive you are. So uh -huh. I'm, I, I don't even think that I realize how sensitive I am. Um, but I can like when I ride in a, in a, when Priuses first came out and I rode in a Prius, I would always notice that the top of my head would be like hot. Um, when I would ride in them, I, because apparently I'm quite sensitive to EMFs, but uh -huh. it's not something that I that I notice. I recently did a, um, but I guess I kind of do now that I'm thinking about it. I recently did a sleep retreat where I was doing live online um, training for people for three hours for three days in a row. And I was wearing Bluetooth um, Air, Air, AirPods because uh -huh. my mic system with Zoom was not working properly. And by the end of those three days, I was fried. Like I could feel the heat in my ear from the, from the AirPod. And I just, I had to go and like walk barefoot in my lawn to kind of ground myself. Cause I did not feel good. Um, so uh, when I was interviewing someone not too long ago, they recommended that I turn off the breaker to my bedroom at night. And I started doing that and I found that I sleep more deeply. So now I do that every oh. night and it's, it's kind of uh, ghetto, but I have a electrical cord <laughs> that runs from a different part of my house down my hallway into my bedroom and my son's bedroom to power our air purifiers. Cause that's what I use for my white noise machine. Um, because I can't plug it into the wall and have it work because the electricity is completely dead. And I've noticed a difference for me yeah. in, in my sleep quality. Um, for some people, it might not be a thing for them, but for me, it is. Um, another thing that can be um, problematic for people is metal springs in their bed, because those are also um, conductive for electricity. So uh -huh. if someone's sensitive to EMFs, they might want to not have um, any any metal in their bed. Yeah, 
Yeah, great tips. But you were asking something about um, dreams, and I feel like I didn't answer your question. What was it? Well, actually, so does is there anything in our dream content that we should remember and could improve our sleep quality, or is that just a totally separate type of subject altogether? No, no, no. I, I'm happy to answer it. I call <laughs> dreams mental Cuisinart. Mental, because mental what? Cuisinart. Okay. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, because uh, dreams, I feel like just based on my own experience and, you know, people that I've talked to who are dream experts, uh, we can learn a lot from our dreams, uh, you know, that um, has an inference to our, our waking life. But I think a lot of it is just processing all of the things that, you know, we didn't consciously process during our, our daily, our, our waking life. And so I remember I have very, very vivid, clear dreams that I remember every single night that I could <clears throat> like write a novel about. <laughs> and um, and yet I don't I don't do much with it. You know, like I'll wake up in the morning and I'll lay there for a few minutes and I'll think about what um, what I dreamt about and just kind of be with it. and I get on with my day. Uh, some people spend a lot more time, you know, doing dream journaling and really exploring what that means for them. And I don't think that there's a right or a wrong. It's really, you know, what feels um, benef beneficial and supportive to you. Yeah. Great advice. Um, talking about digital devices again, uh, we, we've talked about, <laughs> I love the hack of running a cable down to the, it doesn't sound ghetto at all. I think it's, it's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> running a, a cable down for the for the nighttime devices you mentioned blue light before is there anything we could do to you know somebody sitting working in a laptop all day which is the reality for a lot of people or working at a desktop is there anything they can do to minimize the impact of the blue light yep so i'm gonna i was i normally wear these when i'm working i didn't wear them today but uh they're they're blue light glasses and anytime that I'm in front of a computer when I'm not doing an interview, um, I wear them. And there's different lenses that I use for different times of the day. So these are just, they block. So there's a whole story about blue light and blue light has gotten a lot of bad rap. The reality is that just like we evolved with this, the, um, the sun setting and that, that cues our, our ability to sleep. We also evolved being outdoors in nature, getting natural sunlight on our skin. Um, and most of us don't get nearly the amount of sunlight exposure that we need in order to be healthy. So if you were to measure your vitamin D levels, you probably, if you're listening, don't have, unless you're taking a vitamin D supplement, you probably don't have sufficient amounts of vitamin D and vitamin D is a very, very important um, nutrient, not only for healthy bones, which is, you know, the thing that it gets most pressed for, but also for sleep. So if you don't have optimized vi vitamin D, it probably is affecting your ability to, to sleep well. And so first and foremost, even if you work in an office, I would say, go outside during your lunch break, you know, even if it's cold, take your jacket off, try to get as much sun as exposure as possible. There's a lot of misinformation out there about um, the uh, sun damage and the need to constantly wear sunscreen to protect ourselves from the sun. Um, it is true that the sun can cause uh, skin damage, However, it's also true that we need a lot of natural sunlight exposure. And depending on the climate and the, um, the fairness of your skin um, is, is going to dictate how much sun you get. But here's the thing. The reason that people usually have sun damage is because they don't get sun. And then they're like, I'm going to go for spring break and I'm going to lay on the beach at high noon for six days in a row but they didn't give their skin time to acclimate to being in, in, the, in the strongest part of the day in the sun. Our ancestors were probably lived in some sort of shelter, a hut or something like that. And when the sun came up, they were outside mm -hmm. and the sun has 
different miraculous wonderful parts of it that um that the the light that occurs at different times of the day so in the early morning and at sunset the sun has a lot of infrared light which is really really healing for the body and most people are deficient in infrared light so it's really important to get outside as much as you can first thing in the morning at 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 um, sunset in the evening, just before the sun is setting, because you're absorbing different um, parts of the spectrum of light than you are at high noon. So number one, get as much natural sunlight exposure as possible, even if you're working indoors. Number two, if you are working indoors, definitely use a lens technology to protect yourself. And um, the, the type of lens technology that you use and the type of um, light that you're blocking should mimic what's going on with the sunlight. So I don't have them around, but I have another pair of glasses and they're actually these clip and goes. So there's like a frame that has basically like a clear lens with a, a slight yellow tint. And that would be something that I would use for noontime. This is something that I would use in the evening and in the morning when I'm, you know, if I need to check my phone first thing in the morning, when I get up, I would use these. And then I have another lens that's red and you want that for, um, for the nighttime, if you need to be on your computer or, um, or on your phone or something like that at nighttime, then you should really be blocking all of the blue and the green spectrums of light, because those are the ones that wouldn't naturally be occurring. Um, and that are disruptive to the production of melatonin. So it depends on the time of day that you're using it and what you're doing. I will say that um, in general, blue light exposure after dark isn't great, but it also depends on the um, distance of the device away from your face. So if you're working on your laptop, definitely, definitely use a lens technology. If you're watching um, TV and it's all the way across the room, you're not going to have as much of an issue with it, but it's also something to be aware of because if you're really sensitive to it, then it could really be disruptive to your sleep. And another thing that you can get for your computer is a program called Flux. It's free. Uh -huh. um, it's F.LUX, but it yep. basically um, will take the, the blue light tones and make it a much warmer tone that your computer screen is emitting. And then different phones have different settings, like the iPhone has a night shift that you can set where it will also take the, the blue light away. But the one thing that I want to say is that um, even these glasses that I have, which are daytime glasses, they don't block 100% of the blue light because blue light isn't bad in and of itself. It's a part of the natural um, spectrum of light that we get from the sun. The problem is that blue, um, that screens have a um, unbalanced amount of blue light that comes off of the screen. So if you were to look at um, like the, the, um, a graph of the light from the sun, it would be kind of like a, a slow arc of the different amounts of light. But if you look at the blue light from from this or the light from a screen, there's this really high arc of the amount of blue light and, and green light that comes off of the screen, which is an unnatural amount. So you don't want to block 100% of the blue light from the light from your computer. You just want to make it as balanced as possible. Um, using a lens technology that balances it. And they don't all do that. So you really need to um, get your lens, your your blue light glasses from a company that does a spectro, spectrometer, I don't know, it's some sort okay. of reading <laughs> that um, that tells that, you know, tests the lenses and tells you exactly how much um, of each type of light that is um, going through them. And also this is true with, um, with the the lighting that you have in your office or in your house the um, fluorescent bulbs are very very um, strong in the blue and um, and white spectrums of light which is unnatural so if possible you really want to use a um, a balanced uh, bulb that has a more natural um, uh, spectrum of light uh, instead of the unnatural bulbs yeah, the, the Flux app, I have that on my phone, actually. It's fantastic. But if someone wanted to get the blue light glasses, where would they? Where do they find something like that? Do they need to go an optician or can they be found easily online? So I, because I because of the, the business that I'm in, I, I research this. Okay. 
And there's a few companies that I know for sure um, make really good lenses and that do the testing that needs to be done. And those are um, Blue Block, Viva Rays, and Raw Optics. Uh -huh. And there may be others out there. And if you're out there and you want me to know about you, <laughs> definitely contact me. But those are the ones that I know for sure, you know, do do what they say that they do and have good integrity in their products. There's other companies that say that they do and they don't. So you definitely want to do research and make sure that you're you're buying something that actually works and is helpful for you. And the other thing is that I learned recently is that blue light actually can contribute to macular degeneration. So just beyond even being able to sleep well, it's really important to protect your eyes for that reason also. This is great. So many great tips. And, thank you. and oh, the go. other thing that I would say just about that is that because you were asking about prescriptions, um, I think both blue blocks, I don't know about raw optics, but I know that blue blocks and beaver rays, they can take your prescription and, and actually make the, the glasses so that you, it's the prescription is in the glasses. Yeah. So provide them the details and they'll, they'll build it in. Fantastic tips. I've got, um, I know it, we've, we've, we've talked for quite a while already, but I want to ask you about, uh, this happens to me a lot, actually, when you lie, you lie down in bed, you've had a busy day, something's on your mind. Usually for me, it's something on my mind. It's usually to do with work and your mind is just racing and you just lie there and you're like, I can't sleep because my mind's just so active. Is there anything that we could do to calm a really active mind and help us get to sleep at night time? Is there anything, any tips or tricks that you would recommend? Yeah, this is, it's, it's not a simple answer. And I know that everybody wants a quick fix. Um, so if your mind is racing at night, that means that you didn't take enough time during the day to process your day before you went to bed. And it could also mean, you know, if it's a one, if it's a one-off thing, then it's, it's a different conversation than if you're having chronic racing mind or chronic anxiety, which would indicate an underlying health issue that is contribute, you know, an, an underlying physiological imbalance that's causing the racing mind. We don't just have racing mind and it's an independent thing from the rest of the way that our body is working. So a racing mind is part of that sympathetic dominant um, status that we were talking about. And so then the question is, why are you in a sympathetic dominant state instead of in a parasympath parasympathetic, parasympathetic state at night when you should be, you know, winding down and unwinding, why, why is that happening for you? And it could be, you know, that you just had a really rough day that, you know, you, you had a, a, a fight with a family member, or, you know, you got in a car accident or some, you know, you had a death in the family. And if that's the case, then in those instances, I feel like you just have to be gentle with yourself and realize that it's, it's just one day and that, you know, you'll probably sleep really well the following night and you might just have to muscle through your day. You can also do various relaxation techniques like deep breathing. The breath is one of the most amazing, powerful and overlooked parts of being a human being. And when we are taking shallow breaths, it tells our body that we should be in a sympathetic dominant state. So one of the easiest ways to shift into a parasympathetic state is to actually consciously con control your breath and deepen your breath. And there's various ways to do that. There's something called box breathing, which is a four, four, four breath where you inhale for four seconds, you hold your breath for four seconds, you exhale for four seconds, and you hold your breath for four seconds and you just keep doing that. There's also a five, seven, nine breath where you inhale for five seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, exhale for nine seconds, do a short hold, and then do that pattern over and over again. I think it's less about the, you know, the, the specifics of it and more about, you know, you experimenting and figuring out what works for you. Um, I would also say that if um, it's not a good idea, so the brain works in really magical and mysterious ways that I don't think that science fully understands yet, but it can become trained. 
So if you work in bed, you eat in bed, you watch TV in bed, and then you also try to sleep in bed, then your brain thinks, your brain can get confused and say, okay, well, I'm in bed, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be, you know, active? But if you reserve your bed and your and your bedroom environment just for sleep and for sex, then you'll know that that's, you know, when your head hits the pillow, that's what you're supposed to do. And in that same vein, if you're not able to sleep because you're all wound up, don't stay in bed for hours and hours tossing uh -huh. and turning. Get up, do something chill. That doesn't mean flip on bright lights. That doesn't mean, you know, turn on your computer. That doesn't mean go back to work. But maybe it means just going to a different place like a couch or, a, you know, a, a comfortable chair and resting there. Maybe it means if you have a lens technology, you know, reading a, a, a boring book um, until you feel tired again um, or doing some gentle stretching. Uh, but there's a, um, a process called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia which is used very successfully for people who have chronic severe insomnia. And in that, um, that process and in that methodology, they basically shorten the sleep window for people. So instead of eight hours, you, you start out with a lot uh, shorter amount of time because the reality is, even though I hear so many of my clients say, I can't sleep, I, I can't sleep. The reality is that if they really weren't sleeping, they'd be dead because uh, you must sleep in, in order to, to, to stay alive. And so while you might not be sleeping well, you're, you're definitely still sleeping. And so anyways, with cognitive behavioral therapy, they shorten the sleep window, but then they also say, if you try to go to sleep and you can't sleep for more than 10 to 15 minutes, you get up and you, and you don't, you don't lay in bed because you want to retrain your body and your brain that, you only stay in bed when you're sleeping. Yeah, all a part of that sleep sanctuary, that place that you create great sleep hygiene. The, the, the example that for me was <laughs> last night, actually, it happened, uh, but it was because I picked up, and I already know the answer. Now that I'm talking to you and I'm saying this, I'm like, oh, I know what I did wrong. I picked up my phone and I saw a note and it was invitation for a speaking engagement, which I got excited about. And then, of course, I got into bed and all I could think about was the sleeping engagement. And for me, it's like an itch I have to scratch. So I just got up and dealt with the, uh, you know, wrote down some ideas and whatever. But, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's great advice, I think, to get out of the bedroom and then come back and when you're ready to clear your mind. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I mean, so it, I love that you shared that example because stress is or stimulation is, you know, it can be um, a, a challenging thing. Like it, one thing definitely that I would say is, Try not to have difficult conversations in the evening because people are tired and their brains aren't working well. And I think a lot of um, people that are in a relationship, you know, the kids are asleep. Now it's time to like address stuff, but that's actually the worst time. And I know I've heard so many times people say, you know, never go to sleep when you're angry with your partner. Um, and I actually disagree with that because if you, if you, can like set it aside enough to say, okay, we'll address this in the morning um, and get a good night's sleep. You'll actually be better off and more, more capable of addressing a challenging thing than trying to have it, you know, at the end of the day when you're exhausted. So trying to um, avoid stimulating things, you know, if I heard someone say that if you wake up in the night and you can't sleep, read something boring, like your refrigerator manual, like something really, <laughs> That is not going to, to get your mind going because once your mind is active, it's really hard to, to get it wind, wound down again. Yeah, and I love what you said about the breathing as well because another one that I use is a Headspace app. I don't know if you've come across that one, but uh, it has breathing techniques, meditation techniques, and actually once I've scratched the itch, that's usually what I go to next and it gets me tired again. So, <laughs> But as yeah. you say, it's very personal, isn't it? It's each, each person's got their own individual uh, ways of dealing with it. Yeah, I haven't tried Headspace. Um, I, I use BrainTap um, sometimes, yeah. which is wonderful as well. It has um, different uh, frequencies that, you know, that get you into um, different uh, 
brain frequencies that that you know will kind of drop you down into more restful states well the brain is one powerful mechanism and i find even just a couple of minutes of meditation can completely change the mood of the day but that's a whole other podcast i want to quickly recap because there are so many nuggets of information you've given us so uh, one Consistent routine uh, is critical for great sleep. Two, getting enough natural daylight for melatonin. Three, having your room dark and quiet. Four, a cooler temperature at night will acclimatize the body and get you ready for sleep. Five, limiting electromagnetic frequencies in the bedroom, EMFs. Six, less pillows is more for sleep. Seven, Avoid caffeine, especially in the second half of the day, or any stimulants for that matter. Eight, avoid MSG. Nine, if you have to use a phone or a laptop, consider getting lens technology like Flux, F.Lux, or use blue light lenses. So is there anything that I missed there, Susie? No, I mean, I can, I can talk yeah, about too much. The cows come home, but I think that's a really good, um, a really good, you know, foundation for people to get started. Susie, your tips have been fantastic. So if anyone wants to find you or anyone wants to follow you on Instagram or anything like that, how can we, how can we find you? How can, how can listeners um, find all your great advice? Thank you for asking. So I have a website and it's my name. So it's Susie Sank, which is spelled S-U-Z-I-E-S-E-N-K.com. And you can go on there and you can sign up for a free gift that I offer and get on my mailing list. And that's really the best way to stay in touch with me because I send out regular emails with tips and tricks and free gifts and offers and all sorts of wonderful things for the people who are a part of my 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 membership and my my people great well i'm also going to put that up on the website so if anyone's looking for it you can find it on the site uh and also i put it on soundcloud so thank you so much again for joining us i really appreciate it uh, you've been wonderful thank you so much rob have a great day well, so much great advice today. Susie is practically a rock star of sleep hygiene. So I encourage you to head on over to her site and sign up to her mailing list. None of this information is anything you will learn in a textbook at school. And that's the point of the Grind Academy. I'm learning podcasting every day and I hope the episode was of practical benefit to you. If you like the podcast, let me know by posting and tagging me in on Instagram at grind.equity. Thank you for listening to the Grind Academy today. I want to wish you a fantastic week ahead. Grind hard at what you love. Do it with purpose. And most of all, never ever give up.